This is Guy Burgess. For this post, I want to talk in more detail about the nature of the divide and conquer authoritarian and plutocratic threat. Again, the focus here is on defending democracy and not partisanship. And while there will be things here that imply some criticism of President Trump, that's not the main focus. The main focus is defending democracy. And the truth is that President Trump is not so much the problem, but a symptom of a much, much larger problem. And this goes to Sarah Che's book about thieves of the state and corruption and the threat it poses to global security. But it also adds to that the kind of threat that's posed by emerging technologies, which I think are changing the game in very worrisome ways. And again, the thought is to focus on the dangers posed by what you might call the global oligarchy. These are the very, very rich and powerful folks operating through a wide range of very multinational organizations that are to varying degrees in various countries accumulating ever more wealth. The other thing, this goes back to my kind of silly diagram about puppeteers and divide and conquer conflict manipulators. But it's important to understand that the struggle against authoritarianism is different from the struggle between the left and the right. And that to a very significant degree, in fact, increasingly to an alarming degree, this conflict between the left and the right is being driven by the manipulators and not sort of grassroots public feeling. Uh, in the last post, I highlighted this article, which I'll mention again briefly, which is a pretty good detailed description of how this plays out in real life. And the whole idea here and again, this I highlighted some in the last post, so we'll be very quick with it, is that you've got to build a coalition of something close to the 99% to challenge the authoritarians and plutocrats. To do that, you've got to somehow damp down the animosities of the conflict at the same time folks are trying to inflame them. Uh, so basically, you're trying to break this spiral that I talked about. Now, early on, I mentioned, and this is an early post that's been up for quite a long time, but I think it's important in this context, it explores the conflict between coexistence fighters and divide and conquerors. And what this does is it imagines aligning everybody, all the people in a society in a big row. And toward the center, you have the compromisers or the folks who want to find some way to coexist constructively. And then you've got at each end, you've got the fighters that think for whatever reason that their side's just got to fight on to victory. And then in the middle, there are the gold swing people who can't quite decide which way to go. And some of these fighters are principled fighters that really do believe that they've got to fight to defend their group's interests against the injustices perpetrated by others. But other fighters are just these divide and conquer types that are trying to manipulate the whole thing. In any event, the key is to somehow build peace. And this doesn't mean agreement. This means an agreement to coexist and tolerate each other to the maximum extent possible while still constructively engaging some very difficult conflict issues. And reframing things as a conflict between not only the power with constructive coexistors, the swing people, and also the principal fighters against the folks who seek power over everybody else. Another metaphor that's a good one in this context is the distinction between grassroots conflict, which reflects deep underlying feelings of the population, and high-tech astroturf politics, where it's all fake, and it's engineered with a bunch of very 
sophisticated propaganda techniques. Another way to think about this that I think is illuminating is that there are two models of political advocacy out there. Sometimes you pe hear people saying, well, the Democrats are focused on, you know, if you want to be a democratic politician, you study policy and you learn how to put together policy papers that sensibly try to uh, analyze issues and propose compromises. And then the claim is, and this is, there's a certain element of truth in it, but not completely, that the alternative approach and the alternative route into politics is advertising. And advertise is all about persuading people, sometimes manipulating people, into taking whatever position you want. And the truth is advertisers are very, very good at selling people things they don't really want or need. Um, using a sophisticated manipulation of the complex psychology of people, as well as being able to um, operate in the mass communication environment, which characterizes today's world. So at one level, the competing policy briefs folks also need to learn to communicate and argue for their policy briefs in the advertising world of high-tech persuasion and do so in a way that can counteract propaganda and really show people the advantages of working together to solve problems. So what we're dealing with now, and this is different from what we've seen before, and I'll show you some citations that give you a lot more information on is a new, new to the 21st century, based on information technology, strategy for using um, divide and conquer approaches and complex disinformation and propaganda uh, to advance the cause of these authoritarian wannabes. And there's a step-by-step -step plan. And this is a little different from what we outlined earlier when we were talking about the basic divide and conquer strategy, but this is what we're dealing with now. Uh, first of all, you need a very sophisticated ways to identify politically relevant personality types. And our understanding of the complexities of psychology and neurobiology has got us to the point where we're really, as a community of humans, I mean, the human society is or has people who are really, really good at this. The next thing key to this disinformation threat is the tyrant wannabes need to be able to obtain information from both legitimate and illegitimate sources that's sufficient to allow them to first identify and contact individual people. So you can have a message and it goes to this particular person, not to the society as a whole and then be able to categorize those people according to personality type. And this is something that Cambridge Analytica figured out how to do, and people are getting better and better at. The next key is to prepare materials that inflame tensions, drive the escalation spiral, make left-right compromise seem impossible, and demand support from one side or the other for the all-out fight. And we're getting increasingly good, or shall we say the tyrant wannabes are getting increasingly good at figuring out how to do this. And you can look at some of the compilations, and again, I've got some suggested citations, the kind of ads they're putting together. Then what you want to do is a couple of things. As you create on social networks lots and lots of fake people, to be presented to others, your target audience, as trusted friends. So it isn't an ad that they're getting. They're getting advice from people just like them who they trust. And this kind of fake peer group pressure is especially insidious. Uh, the next step, and these are kind of in parallel tracks, is to create and, if possible, monopolize news sources that character narrow cast that is focus a particular message on a particular audience 
Uh, this is something that talk radio has been good at. Uh, Fox Radio or Fox News is good at. And the truth is it's there, there are similar things on the left that tell folks what they want to hear. Um, and so the next step is to distribute these propaganda materials uh, that you've created, you've identified the people, by personality type to individuals using a social network of friends. Another key to this is something called the fire hose of falsehood. So you flood the media environment with so many competing outlandish claims that nobody can really expect to figure out what's true and what isn't. Uh, so they just believe what they want to hear. And the final part of this is you hide all of this behind a zillion shell companies and um, confidential arrangements and nobody knows who's doing it. So um, that's the broad strategy. Uh, just some citations you might want to look at. Here's a bunch of articles about Cambridge Analytica, which, and this guy on the left, whose name escapes me at the moment, is the guy who sort of figured out how to do this and then said, hey, this is a bad idea and turned into a whistleblower. And this is the count of his story of the Steve Bannon psychological warfare tool. And there's some other stories. There's a, um, one on, you know, does this really work? And the key thing is what they did at the last election maybe didn't quite work. And, you know, folks who are thinking that uh, it, it decided everything might be overstating the case. But the danger is that we're getting better and better and better at this. So it's a continuing and emerging and evolving threat. Now, to give you a sense of the magnitude of the fake people problem, and this was just yesterday that there was testimony before Congress from an executive F Facebook, who, among other things, according to this account, uh, claimed that there are two billion Facebook users in the world. That's a lot of users. The thing that really got me is that they've deleted 1.2 billion fake user Facebook accounts. And even while they're doing that, people are busy generating them uh, so that there are 3% of fake users still in the system at any one time. So that tells you somebody is trying very, very hard to keep playing this game. And they've got to have deep pockets to be operating at that level. Uh, then there's the fire hood hold. Then there's the fire hose of falsehood um, problem, and this is a a um, article from the Rand Corporation, research applied to national defense, on the Russian fire hose of falsehood propaganda model, and how it's working and what might be used done to oppose it. Uh, you certainly see a window into this in some of the indictments that have come out of the various investigations of Russian influence into the last election. Again, it identifies specific people and exactly what they did. Um, this propaganda warfare also gets tied into other kinds of warfare. Uh, and these articles talk about the Russian art of hybrid warfare. Um, so this is, at one level, a direct international attack, and it continues to intensify in sophistication that's trying to prevent democracy from working, which leaves the field open to authoritarian plutocratic regimes around the world. Um, the other thing to emphasize is that it's not just the Russians. I mean, we are playing politics using a lot of these same techniques. It's not quite clear because it's all very carefully hidden who's doing what. But to assume that it's all just the Russians, I think, would be a big mistake. And that this is what politics has become, and we have to find some way to block that. And all of this is kind of a precondition or tied up with efforts to promote coexistence and tolerance along these 
distributional and cultural divides that I mentioned earlier. I also talked about how this is an emerging threat and it keeps getting more and more sophisticated, especially as you start to apply artificial intelligence technology. And these are, again, are a couple of articles that give you a sense of what this is all about. Again, highly recommend it. And just in order to keep depressing you, um, this is, these are two articles that talk about how authoritarian rule is being solidified in China by using a wide range of monitoring technologies, many of them tied to your smartphone and others are tied to um, face recognition on anybody who gets on a train or a bus and all sorts of very sophisticated tracking technologies that wind up assigning people social credit scores and if you wind up doing things that the powers that be think aren't deserving of social credit then your life chances start taking a really big hit and this raises the prospect of an authoritarian regime with an enormous amount of ability to control people. And this last dismal article that I um, talked about in the first post in this series talks in more detail about how this might work. So bottom line is figuring out some way to diffuse these conflicts that are getting exacerbated is the key to getting a handle on the technology threat and saving democracy. When we start thinking about what this means for the lives of our kids and our grandkids and pretty much anybody else that we care about, um, it gets pretty scary. Uh, but we just can't give up. Uh, we've got to get past worry, fear, and depression and actually start taking concrete and realistic steps to address the problem. Uh, the thing that we found encouraging in working on this massively parallel peace building project is that there are, in fact, lots of realistic things that could be done uh, to get us closer to a solution. And in the next post, what I'm going to try to do is build on these last series of mapping posts and identify some very specific steps. Uh, that we can all take uh, to help address this. So don't be too terribly depressed, but the truth is we've got to actually start doing things.